Hello, everybody, and welcome to Mind Mine with Tatiana and Evan. This is episode 35. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Good to see you. Hopefully, you've had a hell of a week and uh, you've been able to truly enjoy it and hopefully are very excited now and have some awesome plans for this weekend. Again, tons of potential, as always, right? Excuse me, we do stream live every single week. And so, of course, right now we're doing this as a live stream, uh, but you may be also listening to us on iTunes or Google Play or Player FM or any other podcast aggregator. And with that, we greatly appreciate you doing that. So make sure to hit subscribe or follow there as that's the best way uh, to know whenever a new episode gets launched. But also feel free to join us live on Twitch every single week as well on Thursdays and Saturdays. Again, where we talk about all sorts of topics that you hear in the podcast. But the only difference is you're in chat. So you get to share your voice, your opinions, your philosophies, beliefs, and what have you in the chat. Get a real good discussion going on. And also get to tell us. What are some things that you're interested in? What are some things that you want to hear more about? And that's one thing that we want to pride on for this show is the fact that you get to have a voice in what we discuss. Again, our job here for us, what we've chosen to do is to try to find things that are important and we think impact your life. But the more information we get on you and what you want as well, we're able to cover that more. Because there could be things happening in your local area that we might not know about being out of Southern California that you think doesn't get enough attention. If that's the case, then this is a great way of letting us know that so that way we can help report on it, report on it even further and shed hopefully some more light and get some more people thinking and looking into said topics. And with it, of course, that all wraps into journalism. And so with journalism, we wanted to break down what is journalism exactly, right? What do journalists look at? How do they break down, and not even just journalists, but the media, reporters overall that we see on TV, hear on the radio, see on YouTube. Uh, what do they do exactly when it comes to putting together a story? Yes, and uh, today we're going to specifically be covering how to write a lead. Um, so talking about how to create a great beginning for a story. We're not going to delve too much into, you know, how journalists get their facts or um, uh, sort of some of the other key elements. Uh, uh, obviously, you know, when you're writing a news story, you sort of do it in the inverted pyramid. It's what they call it, the inverted pyramid writing style where you don't necessarily start chronologically or, um, you know, you don't necessarily always start with uh, something that leads to something else uh, in a natural way, but rather you start with the most important information first, uh, the one that's going to get the biggest punch, the biggest part of the pyramid, as it were, and then from there you, you spin your story in uh, whatever fashion uh, or whatever type of story you're trying to get across at and putting some of the less relevant information all the way at the bottom. So typically that's how um, at least news stories get written, but also a lot of different other journalistic pieces would start off the same way. Uh, so what we're going to go into right now is um, how to write that beginning, how to write um, the actual uh, uh, first few sentences of your story to get people to actually continue reading, right? It's sort of like if you're watching something on YouTube and you have that three second intro uh, of your ad before they skip it, <laughs> uh, you want to put the most uh, valuable information at the top to get people to actually continue reading. So Point Park University Online has this really great uh, blog post that they set up and uh, we're going to go through that and they actually give really good examples of seven types of leads um, for this. Now, of course, you know, um, the leads, besides giving the essential information, they're also setting the tone and um, they're going to put your voice forward, right? So if you're writing for somebody else, if you're ghostwriting, if you're getting paid to write, you might want to take that into consideration as well 
that what you may find enticing at the beginning may not be what the voice or the tone that whoever you're writing for may want you to, uh, I guess, put forth. Obviously, if you're writing a news story, you want to be as truthful, as comprehensive, and as relevant, and as objective as you can be. Um, but of course, one of the, I think, aspects of journalists, uh, journalism is that you also, you have to have a little bit of subjectivity in that you technically choose the stories that you're going to write about, and you're going to put your own spin on them because we're all people. Uh, but you want to be as truthful, relevant, comprehensive, and objective as you can be as well. And of course, um, general tips for, for writing your stories uh, beginning is you want to do the, you know, the five W's and the H, right? The who, what, when, where, and why, and how. Uh, and if you can put all of, as many of those as possible in that first sentence, you're going to get people hooked. Um, but you also want to keep it short you don't want to overwhelm the person in that first sentence or in that first paragraph with too much information, right? You want to do a teaser at some point, in some ways, to keep them reading the article. Uh, you also want to, of course, write in the active voice, uh, right? You don't want to say uh, were uh, too much um, and kind of have that passive voice. You want to have an active tone to your story. and. You want to understand the context, right? Hopefully, if you are a journalist, you have all of the facts that you need, but that may not always be the case, right? At which point, it's very important to not fabricate things. Uh, try not to include hearsay or rumors, or, or if you do, to kind of fill up your article. Make sure that you notate, hey, this is, <laughs> this is hearsay or rumors, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but be honest, right? Don't mislead the reader. And and that can be hard when you don't have all the facts, right? Or when you don't have the full story or when you don't truly understand the context. Well, so, and even then, it's not so much being honest as just sharing what you have. It's just unfortunately an incomplete picture at that point. It's kind of like involuntary dishonesty in Ooh. a way. <laughs> you know, it's like it, you're not trying to be dishonest, but the point is, is that you just might not know everything. And we'll discuss this, especially with the, the Jacksonville uh, situation. But, you know, we, we tend to see that media once you know, each media platform wants to be the first to get a piece of information out there. Right. Because they want people clicking on their website, because, again, how they get paid is through their advertisers most of the time, because most of the time for uh, subscription uh, sort of platforms or systems, uh, for whatever reason, media just doesn't do well with that anymore, right? No one wants to be a, subscri a subscriber to their newspaper anymore, but they'll subscribe to like Loot Crate or, or something else that's completely different, right? So, you know, they need to figure out a new system. And so right now, though, they're stuck on, well, I just need the most eyes on our site or on our page or, you know, on our channel in order to get that attention. So they try to be the first, but unfortunately what we see is a lot of issues with that because they rush through it and they're not able to put in appropriate research or be able to piece all the points together to give a clear image. So a lot of times it can be misrepresented or misleading. That's true. Um, right, but if you, if you are a journalist, an author who is trying to write something because you want to spin a certain story, you may uh, inadvertently leave out some facts that maybe don't fit your story, right? Because if you're trying to frame something in a particular light, so um, it's good It's good to be as, as, as honest as possible, um, understanding that sometimes there is, uh, I, like, I like how you called that involuntary dishonesty or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's good to note too, I, I know I've read some articles in the past where I feel like at the end of the article, the author does note that something like this is, uh, you know, kind of like this is the old, all the information that we have as of X, uh, you know, this is the time at, especially if yeah. you're if you're uh, reporting on something that's happening currently right now. 
Yeah, and sometimes the articles, too, unfortunately, they, they wait to the very end of the article, right? <laughs> well, you got to read the whole thing and watch through all the ads. You but know? the thing is that most people <laughs> don't read all the way to the very end, right? So they never see this. And I think that's problematic, too. It's like, it's good that you have it on there. But the reason why you're putting it at the end is because you want people, ideally, to read through it the first time around. And then hopefully you're hoping that they'll come back because the page will be updated, the article will be updated. Because a lot of times, you know, these platforms will say, well, this article will keep getting revised um, as soon as new new developments occur. Well, the problem is most people skim. They don't even see that. So sure, they're staying on reading the article, but then they assume, okay, that's it. That's all the facts, which is unfortunate as well. So it's like, yeah, I understand the business aspect, but you got to think about the human aspect too. And sometimes... Uh, I feel like media types, reporters, journalists, they forget about the human side of things and who who they're trying to benefit with said information. Ironically, because they're writing about people. Yeah, people most of the time, it. yeah. <laughs> well, and I, I think it's interesting to note how online, this like instant ability to read about something that's happening right now is fairly newer in our evolutionary scale, right? Because, you know, when the printing press first came out and, like, newspapers came out, but, he, you know, people had to wait the next day to truly find out what happened. Yeah. Whereas now with just online and, and even with platforms that are that everybody's writing on, like Twitter or Facebook or... or like you know. social media platforms, right. It's so hard then to, as a journalist, you have to get a, you have to get ahead of that in some ways because you want people to come to you first, right? Right. You want to be the trusted voice. But because things are happening in real time, it's hard to, right, like you, you have to kind of just, in a way, rush to get the story out in whatever semblance of a, of a cohesive story that might be in. <laughs> Um, which I think, you know, it, it's a struggle that obviously journalists didn't have before. And I wonder, actually, uh, you know, I know we talk about, uh, you know, a university online here that we're uh, reading some of these tips from. And I wonder how schools nowadays are actually talking about this and, and trying to deal with this uh, with their students. You know, like teaching yeah. them, you know, okay, journalism in, in the environment of all the information is happening right now. How do you find out all the most truthful, relevant, and comprehensive information at the same time? Well, and I do know at least that there are certain universities that have created classes specifically around journalism and social media. But as for what they actually teach, I, I don't know the specifics on. But I, I've at least been like impressed whenever I do see a university that does have a class like that. Because I do think it's important because mm -hmm. that, that is a huge factor to how the media runs and how the media shares out information. Right. And, you know, I, I think, too, that many, many media platforms are masters at the five W's and H. Uh, <laughs> they're masters at keeping it short to a point or at least getting to the, the media information. Right. Because that's what gets people's attention and writing in that active voice. But I think the thing that they fail on is, in some respects, honesty, whether it's, uh, what do I want to say, whether it's on purpose or not. Uh, but also, I think it's just because they're just rushing information out too quickly because they're trying to keep up with it. And they can't because they're still using older platforms and older systems to implement into new technology. And they're just they've just not caught up to that. So they rush everything. And I tell you what. I have seen so many articles recently with typos. Oh yeah! In a in a shocking way, like blatantly obvious, t like typos in the system in their article because they were rushing it so much, and it's crazy because it says, "Oh well, this was the writer, and then here's the editor's name." So you know, there's at least two people that were supposed to go through that to make sure that everything was squared away, and it was clearly not. And, you know, I'm not talking about just like, oh, a word is missing like a letter. I mean, sometimes like a sentence will not be finished. It will not be complete. Yeah. Like, weird shit like that. That just does not make any sense. And I'm like, wait a minute, but you guys are supposed to be professionals. You're right. getting paid to do this. I could have done this and completed the damn sentence. I just did it in my <laughs> head. There you go. Like, pay me. 
I, like, it's just so crazy to think that and that they think it's okay because, well, we're getting information out. Well, if you're putting out typos, you can't even use the language the way you're supposed to for your job. Then, of course, people are going to question then, well, how good is the information, too? Like, did you rush that? Probably. Well, again, I think that online platforms now... Ha Again, when you had to print out a paper, right, like you had to have your shit together because it was going to be distributed to uh, lots of people in a certain area and, the, you know, the company was going to waste ink and paper on your story. But nowadays, I feel like just because you have a website up, it's so easy in one ways, in some ways to like just put up whatever you want to put up. You don't even have to be a journalist, right? You just have to write decently well and here you go you can you can just put stuff up on this on this website especially nowadays when people are looking for you know blogs to get attention and be relevant and so just because it's up online somewhere too it doesn't in it, it's weird because like on the one hand like we that doesn't mean we should trust it because anybody can put up stuff online mm -hmm. uh and right when you come across some of these things where there's typos and there's missing like ends of sentences at that point i'm i'm like wait what am i reading like is this real like what side am i on <laughs> it makes me question it um and yet if somebody puts up something on you know cnn.com we automatically assume oh yeah they gotta they gotta know their shit and i'm like it's probably the same types of people <laughs> who are you know they're they're top journalists aren't sitting there writing, you know, news articles on every single little thing that is happening in the in the country or in the world right this very second, right? They probably have hired other people to do it. Yeah, well, in, in journalism right now is, is interesting, right? Because we're actually seeing, I think in a good sense, the rise of citizen journalists, which we spoke about in an earlier episode, uh, kind of the positives and negatives to that system as well but what we're seeing is more and more people rise up in their neighborhood in their city in their state they're traveling around they're trying to capture uh as many stories as possible that's impacting their neighborhoods uh their people their sort of uh piece of uh of their life right and they want to highlight these so you know now of some because of that we've had coverage on say the flint water crisis and water crises in uh indiana and ohio and uh, among many other really just underplayed uh, news stories that are happening right now that are so important because even if they don't impact your community directly, it's sort of like a sign that something could happen in your community, right? If, if these places are seeing uh, lead pipes or lead poisoning in their pipes, we have, you know, old infrastructure, old systems since the 1950s, which we spoke about uh, this past Thursday. Um, and, and in the past, uh, in other episodes, uh, but we discuss about the fact that, you know, these systems are giving out and just because your system hasn't given out your infrastructure in your area is seeming okay. Doesn't mean eventually you're going to get hit by something, uh, later on down the line. And so a lot of these are great stories in the sense of just being better prepared if something does occur too and to see like how well how do people react how do people respond to these things if there's a lack of action then you got to go there's something wrong with this there's something wrong with our system there's something wrong with um that area like something needs to happen and so again it, it's very important but a lot of times as we're talking about this you know these citizen journalists not, are not always trained in this breakdown in these systems of being able to control the flow uh making sure they understand the context the structure and uh being able to write it in a way that actually engages people to to make them care right right and so that can be a downfall unfortunately as well for these citizen journalists unless they're willing to take the time to educate themselves which is so key um now of course talking about this system and breakdown for articles uh, you know, this school here also, uh, Point Parks, ha does have a breakdown of seven types of leads because um, they say style implies a certain degree of voice and personal ownership over how a story is written. Although there are many ways to write leads, uh, here are seven common approaches if you want to jump into that. So the first is the straight lead. 
It's also called the summary lead, uh, and it's uh, usually the most common and, and traditional version. It they note that it should be used in most cases, and it's a brief summary containing most of, as they mentioned before, the five W's and the H in one sentence. For example, the European Parliament voted Tuesday to ratify the landmark Paris Climate Accord, paving the way for the international plan to curb greenhouse gas emissions to become binding as soon as the end of this week. That's a very relevant topic, y'all. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no kidding on that one. Uh, but basically, from that one sentence, you pretty much you pretty much got all of your information and could potentially just move on to the next article. But if you're more interested in finding more information, you can continue reading on. So it's really it's really good, this this straight summary lead. And this is, I think, also good for SEO purposes. If you are on, on you know writing this online, you can often put it in that like blurb section of your website, or if it's a blog post, right, it'll show up as kind of your summary. So it's really great because it gives you all of the information and you can go straight um, into the article if you want, or you can you can actually bypass the article. Yeah, it, th this is a nice way of letting people know what's happening and to have them make a sound decision on, is this something that's relatable to them or that they care about and want to engage with? Right. And I feel like, too, um, as we go through some of these uh, examples, this is also good information to have um, for yourself as a reader, right? Like you can understand, OK, what kind of story is this going to be or what what is the author going for? And also, if you yourself are writing not only stories, as Evan mentioned, if you're trying to do uh, something like citizen journalism, but also if you're drafting an email to somebody, right? Or if you're trying to figure out how to start a conversation with someone, or you're trying to, you know, get across a, some information to them in a way that will make them listen and be interested, I think these are also useful for that as well. Uh, so the second type of lead is called anecdotal lead. And the anecdotal lead uses a quick, relevant story to draw in the reader. The anecdote, of course, must help enhance the article's broader point, and you must explain the connection to that point in the first few sentences following the lead. So you can't just throw a story together and then not refer back to it or why it's connected to the rest of your story. So for example, this is um, what they say. At the dilapidated morgue in the northern Brazilian city of Natal, director Marcos Brandau walks over the blood-smeared floor to where the corpses are kept. He points out the labels attached to the bright metal doors, counting out loud. It has not been a particularly bad night, yet there are nine shooting victims in cold storage. So first it start, kind of starts out Damn. as if you're reading a, <laughs> like a you know mystery novel or something, right? Um, you're trying to figure out what's going on, and then clearly the story will talk about um, potentially a mass shooting uh, or uh, or some sort of a homicide that took place. Which, you know, sometimes it's important, of course, to give people the visual of, of what's happening, of what's going on, right? And so if you can do something that's enriching in a way of like a story, uh, write it like a when I say a story, I mean like, uh, for instance, like a Sherlock Holmes novel or something like that. You know, if you if you kind of spin it in a way where you get very descriptive and um, really give a really nice visual, yeah, it can pull people in just as well too because it might be hard for them to even think about that, right? They hear morgue but don't even really think about uh, the context or in what shape it's in. Or, you know, if, if we're, for instance, in California, we don't know what it could be like to be in Ireland, for example. So if you give us a little bit of a, of a rich description, it'll give us a better sense of it. So that way we can connect with it a lot easier right off the bat and thus want to continue to read. Right. Now, the third type of lead uh, sounds a little similar, but it's different. Um, it's called the scene setting lead. And the scene setting lead describes the physical location where the story takes place. So if uh, if they wanted to keep uh, going about the dilapidated morgue, uh, you'd have yourself a scene setting lead. But um, this is the example for that. On the second floor of an old Bavarian palace in Munich, Germany, there's a library with high ceilings, a distinctly bookish smell, and one of the world's most extensive collections of Latin texts. 
About 20 researchers from all over the world work in small offices around the room. Cool. So it looks like we're going to be talking a little bit about Latin texts. And I already have like a, this amazing visual of like where this is happening. Uh, and I, I like already want to go there because I love libraries. So <laughs> kudos to whoever wrote that lead. Pretty sweet. Then you have your first person lead. This lead describes the journalist's personal experience with the topic. Clearly, this will be a little harder to do if you as the journalist didn't have a personal experience with this topic. Uh, but it is an intriguing one, uh, of course, to, to use. It should only be used when you have a valuable contribution and perspective that help illuminate the story. So, if, for example, with, with this one, I can read this one. Uh, for many of us, September 11th, 2001 is one of those touchstone dates. We remember exactly where we were when we heard that the planes hit the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. I was in Afghanistan. Which, again, outside of the anecdotal, we see this sort of first-person lead a ton in novels. It's a, there's a reason why it works, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, many of us can connect to September 11, 2001, especially if you're uh, from the U.S. and we're here during that time. And the big thing about this one specifically is that if a, a, a journalist is planning on sharing their point of view, a lot of times they have to try to answer what we like to call the so what factor. Well, so what what you experience? Why should I care? <laughs> Make me care. And so in this way, you're humanizing yourself as the writer and getting people to connect in that sense. And that way people go, oh, you're a person just like I am. Yeah, le <laughs> let me hear your point of view. Let me actually take this in. Instead of being, instead of feeling almost like someone's just talking at you instantly, which I'm sure we've had those strange incidences like on the bus or something like that. If you ever take public transit, people are just like, yeah, the weather today sucks. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. What are you doing? <laughs> or we get this in Twitch all the time where people are like, yeah, this game is stupid. Hi, welcome to chat. How are you doing today? <laughs> nice to meet you. Uh, you know, we don't get that kind of initial handshake. And so with this first person lead, we sort of get this uh, nonverbal handshake with the journalist, with the writer to help us ease into what they're about to dive into. And it's really nice, too, I think, as a reader to see maybe you have something in common with the author, right? If they're uh, talking about a personal experience with knitting and you're like, hey, I knit, too, <laughs> uh, it, it helps uh, kind of make that connection, too, which is nice. The next type of lead is observational lead. So when offering an authoritative observation about a story and how it fits in with the larger picture, you should make sure you know the broader context of your subject matter. For example, tax records and literary criticism are strange bedfellows. But over the weekend, the two combined and brought into the world a literary con controversy. Call it the Ferrante Fuhrer of 2016, which I assume is a mixture of something about taxes and literary criticism that I am not familiar with myself. Yeah, and you know, with this one too, it's nice because you make a strong statement, and even if people aren't familiar with it, you kind of go, "Wait, what? What is this talking about?" And it gets you to read even more because you know this this writer came in with such confidence and mm. just said, "This is this." You go, "Oh, is it? Wait a minute, what?" And then of course you read on, and it goes, "And because of this crazy point that I just made, or this very confident, strong point, this just happened." Oh, so you've given me something to engage my brain with, to make me think and want to continue on to go, wait, where are you going with this? And then you drive it home with, well, and this happened, which is great. And it, it again, though, observational leads, I feel like personally, I've seen a lot of these too on and off, and I feel like they can work initially at least to grab the reader. But once you get to that last point of, Oh, well, the two combined today and blah, blah, blah. Most people, well, I, won't, I don't want to say most people because that's, that's inaccurate for me to use that. But I would say I feel like many people, including myself, though, would look at that and go, okay, well, then I know the beginning, middle, and end here already. I can just leave this article alone. Like, okay, so this happened. Great. Move on. <laughs> and, and you're really only at that point in time going to get the people reading this who actually are in it to win it who are in the industry who are involved with this in some form or fashion 
and have been potentially for years, right? Or they're looking to get into it. So at this point in time, I mean, if you're looking to kind of funnel people out and get the right readers, this could be a very good way of going about it, I think, um, in that sense, because then people will want to read on who actually really care about it. Uh, but then again, it could be detrimental if you're just trying to get views. Mm. And I, I will uh, say that uh, a lot of these leads do have, uh, I just noticed and I wanted to point it out, they do have an active voice, which is really great. Uh, you know, uh, talking about our strange bedfellows, you know, the two combined and brought into the world. Like, that's all active verbs, which is really great to see. But there is a time and place for a more passive voice. And uh, in our next lead, we actually have a, an example of that. This type of lead is called the zinger lead. Zinger. Well, bam. The zinger lead is dramatic and attention grabbing. Although it has a strong tone, it does require a hard set of facts to back it up. Here's the example. His last meal was worth $30,000 and it killed him. Now, the story is about a man who uh, apparently died while trying to smuggle cocaine-filled bags in his stomach. Damn. That got real, real quick. Pretty much. But that's, um, I feel like a lot of stories nowadays actually have zingers. And certainly, if you're sharing something on Twitter, you need a zinger because you don't have much, you don't have much room to, uh, to do any sort of other lead. <laughs> Although... What is it expanded to? Uh, is it 240 characters? So, yeah, around 240 characters, right? I think. Yeah, so, but it, it, even then, still, the zinger is very important for things like social media. It's attention getting. And even businesses use this. This isn't just media that we're talking about here either when it comes to something like these leads working um, within a certain context, right? We're not just talking about media. Like, if you do blog articles on different information and you're looking at ways at how to promote it online and get people to click, mm. Uh, you'll see these leads being utilized by all different kinds of industries talking about all different kinds of subjects. And the Zinger lead specifically, as Tatiana said, you'll see a lot of on Twitter because you only have a limited amount of uh, character space, but also you have a limited amount of time. People are constantly just quickly scrolling through Twitter. And so you really need something that pops, that grabs their attention to make them stop and like hit the brakes basically, right? And get them to click. And so this is going to be something very common that you're going to see on social media. And the last type of lead that we're going to talk about is question lead. And question leads do just that. They ask a question. Although they are effective in sparking interest, use them sparingly because they generally don't provide the main points of a story as concisely. For example, what's increasing faster than the price of gasoline? Apparently, the cost of court lobbyists. Hey! -o. Hey! <laughs> and that's that's true too because I feel like uh, much like the first person lead, asking a question brings about that like almost instant connection to the story for the person, especially if it's about a topic that they have a little bit of knowledge of or are interested in. Mm -hmm. Because they ask you the question, you know, um, that gets your mind to answer it or say what is the answer yes exactly right and you know this is fairly active too they're saying this question the cost of court lobbyists now i, I don't know if i would use the word apparently per chance because that seems like it takes away from the activeness of the voice though like it could be more active by just saying the cost of court lobbyists right much shorter and much more concise exactly just get to the point even more so so obviously, again, these are just the more common used leads. Um, you don't have to use any of these in your story if you don't want to. You can start your story, your, your, however best fits your tone, your voice, and the story itself. Uh, but it is, I, you know, I definitely think that they're right. These are the, the seven types that I have mostly seen out in the world especially online <laughs> yeah and you notice too that again though you know they focus a lot on leads because again it's about getting people to want to care in the first place and to to take the time because people are realizing that time is money 
in that, you know, when you sit down and actually listen to something, watch something, read something, it is an investment. And thus, you know, you need to make sure you can give value right up front, whether that's mm -hmm. starting with a question because by God, you have the answer and they don't, or it's because you have this engaging information that does impact them because you've targeted it and worded it in such a way where they can relate instantaneously, right? And so the focus is just getting attention to you into what you do. Um, whereas then they say, okay, but there is a foundation, of course, right? The five W's and H, keeping it short, brief, to the point, active voice. But so much more attention, though, especially in journalism, is about just getting people to read it in the first place, which is fair to a point because you do want to you know, start off kind of slow. You don't want to just jump into the middle of a conversation because you wouldn't do that in a face-to-face -face conversation, right? right? You wouldn't say, well, September 11, 2001 uh, was really impactful because of that. Because of that, because of what, right? Because, like, what is that what? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And most people don't want to take the time to try to translate what the hell you're trying to get across, right? They don't want to invest that time. So you got to do something that gets it out there initially and gets them already already introduced or warmed up to the topic so they do take the time for it but of course because of this of this focus as well of trying to make sure you can engage people in the first place it can take away from uh what's actually being said in the full body of the paragraph of of this article it can take away from some of the facts as well um which we'll be getting into next as we talk about um, the whole story behind the uh, Jacksonville landing shooting. So for those of you that may not be aware of it, uh, there was a shooting at an eSports Madden event that was being live streamed on Twitch. Uh, evidently, one of the players uh, ended up opening fire onto the group of individuals at this tournament, uh, to which the tournament was cut short, and EA has now announced that they are canceling the rest of the tourney. And, uh, you know, this is, of course, brought up a very old debate and, and to many people, a very annoying debate of, well, does, of course, video games induce violence and what have you, which, again, most people utilize. Well, you know, look at Rainbow Six Siege or look at, you know, all these games with guns. Well, it's like, well, folks, they were playing football. So if anything, I guess then you should be attacking football, right? Well, no, they're not going to go do that. Um, now, mind you, this isn't going to be a debate, and we're not going to turn this into a debate when it comes to uh, gun violence in the U.S. or when it comes to our video games really uh, impacting the youth to corrupt them and teach them how to shoot people. I, again, we've already actually gone into that topic and clearly stated that we think that's all bullshit. But what we want to cover are, um, are the different ways that media has covered this event the different focus points they've fo decided to, to hone in on, as well as the variants of information that we're seeing once this event uh, or this incident occurred, right? So whenever it, it first happened, we saw multiple different versions of the same story. We saw different numbers, you know, oh, two people killed and nine people injured. Oh, four people killed and 12 people injured the numbers kept fluctuating, right? And constant things kept changing and the focus kept changing. And a lot of times though, you'll notice as we go through this, that that change is because why? Well, it's because the gun industry has such a tight grip on the US government that again, politicians, news sources, and what have you will do anything they can to divert it from having a conversation on actually guns. It's much easier to blame it on video games because the video game industry doesn't have that strong of a voice in government. Now, mind you, should any business have a strong voice in government? Fuck no. <laughs> Why? Because the government is for the people, by the people. And thus, it should be based on the overall uh, population of the people being ruled by said government. Or be, I shouldn't say ruled, but sometimes it can feel like that. But being ideally governed by said government, correct? So as we dive into this, we're going to highlight different points. We're going to highlight some of our perspectives on this. Uh, but again, it's to focus in on the fact of where the media keeps kind of changing the story, because this unfortunately is what creates this situation where people go, well, fake news. Now, is all news fake? No, absolutely not. 
are all news sources going to be spewing out fake news? No, absolutely not. But there are things that can influence an article, different perspectives, as we talked about the timing, when an article needs to go out, the push to be the first to get information out, uh, having multiple resources, experiencing the same event, but seeing it differently due to perspective, due to the baggage they brought to that event. There's so many factors into that. Also including the fact that we talk about like political plays, right? Again, people take certain sides and certain parties and therefore they want to focus in on one voice over the other and they kind of not so much become dishonest, but to distort the topics to make it lead someone into thinking in a very different way. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, here, besides the social media storm of tweets and posts that condemned video games and blamed them for inciting gun violence, also, Pat Bondi, Florida's attorney general, which you might be familiar with her, she got into uh, quite a bit of issues uh, when Trump first became president of the U.S. Uh, she goes on TV to spin another rather irrelevant new way to blame mass shootings on video games by saying predators can find your 13-year-old child and ellipsis. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So, you know, a lot of people have been trying to push gun violence on video games and try to blame it, saying they're teaching kids how to be school shooters and how to shoot up uh, movie theaters and things like that. And people are like, no, and the science is not behind that. Research has been done. That isn't an, in that isn't an influencing uh, factor when it comes to a shooting, especially a mass shooting. Uh, so she's also kind of spinning it, too, because of those arguments and going, well, you know, shootings, well, let me divert the attention now and say, well, hey, they could go after your children because of location uh, settings in the game. So uh, Bondi went on to warn that parents should check the settings on the games their children are playing because predators can find you based on location services. According to Bondi, the scary thing is that they could find out where your 13 year old is sitting at home playing that game. Not presumably that almost anyone could have a gun anywhere, including at a pizza restaurant or a video game tournament, because we're also talking about Florida. And, you know, if you're not familiar with it and you hear that, you go, well, wait a minute, wait, what's going on? So Florida, though, has an interesting gun law. <laughs> Florida is a, a shall issue state and issues concealed carry licenses to both residents and non-residents. Florida recognizes licenses from any other state which recognizes Florida license, uh, provided the non-resident individual is a resident of the other state and is at least 21 years old, or they may be under the age of 21 if they are a member or veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces. So basically what this is saying is pretty much anyone who can get a license and pass the, the firearms test can get a gun. And they can bring it anywhere they want. And also, Florida is a state where you can have a concealed carry and you don't have to tell someone that you have a gun on your person, including the police. So, you know, let's not point out the fact that this individual could carry a gun anywhere. It's not like they snuck it in. They had it on their person. They had it concealed. They had a license. They had the fire. Um, they took the firearms test and passed. Everything based on the system that Florida has and we as the U.S. have, he passed. And he was able to carry it anywhere around him. But that's blame, you know, violence in, in games, especially a Madden football game. But let's not blame football for this either, which I don't think they deserve the blame. Don't get me wrong on that. But again, if we're going to go through this line of thinking, why aren't they attacking the NFL? Right, because usually the, the people who talk about how violent video games are making our children kill everybody... It, they're also the people that point out that it's violent video games. And whereas football is not the most peaceful of sports, it does not include picking up a gun and shooting somebody, right? You're not shooting your opponents. You're just throwing a ball. Um, so, I mean, clearly in this particular instance, Bondi is reframing the story to move away from the topic at hand, right? Uh, she conveniently fails to mention that the two men who actually died in this incident, you know, were 27 years old, 22. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the people there were not 12 or 13. Right. Um, so, when, you know, when you're looking at why she's saying this to the media and why they're reporting on this, 
it doesn't make sense. In fact, uh, the author of this particular article literally says, I have no idea what she's even talking about. <laughs> right? Like, why is she bringing up this conversation? It's she's, fear-mongering. She's reframing so that, you know, now we're focused on something else, which is now parents, instead of looking at gun control or other issues, right? They're looking at... <gasps> My 12-year-old could be, like, found out by a predator. Hold on, right? It's like, which is, like, not where the discussion should be going. No, because it, no, it has no right. association to the, the incident at hand. Right. And so, again, it's like, hey, this thing happened here. Hey, look over here. Shiny. Look at the shiny. Look at the shiny. And people tend to then follow suit with that, right? Um, so it's important that, again, articles like the one we've come across here highlight these as well. And I think it's just as important that journalism and the media also write stories on each other <laughs> and, and not to mudsling but a lot of times to point out like well you know what these people are sharing out this this context is incorrect the content to what they're they're, they're pushing out here is driving the story is driving what should be being spoken about is driving everything into the wrong direction here you know we're we're, we're delineating or deviating so severely then now we're going to be jumping into a whole different conversation and we're going to forget how we even got to this point, right? It's going to be like that old uh, Hatfields and McCoys fight where, you know, all of a sudden, 100 years down the line, people are like, why are we even fighting each other to begin with? I don't know, but fuck you, shoot. You know, like, like again, it, it's to try to get to that point where if you create enough separation between the actual core issue and something else, eventually people will forget about the root cause of why we were talking about this to begin with. And sometimes, you know, depending on the stories and then depending on the events that are happening in any given story, um, it, it can be hard, right, if you're not well informed as an individual to read through it and parse what is actually happening, right? Like, I mean, gun control and, you know, sort of the situations and circumstances around this particular event are not new. So for somebody who maybe is very familiar with this issue, you know, they can read this and say, this is a load of BS. For somebody who is not, it's it's much harder to do that, right? And there's some other journalists out there, some other articles and posts that um, blamed the suspect's mental illness as being the sole culprit of this. You know, it was his, his broken home, um, his mental state, all of these things, and that's all they talked about in their articles. Uh, for example, uh, with an article that we will share from CNN, CNN.com, uh, that is titled, What We Know About Jacksonville, Sh Jacksonville Shooting Suspect David Katz, right? And the entire article, the entire article, that's all they focus on it, is his mental state, uh, his broken home, his divorced parents, uh, what people from his high school said, all of this stuff, right? Um, he even... Uh, the the author even has a quote from one of the gamers who was at the event who was shot in the foot um, who said that, well, you know, David lost the a game in the Madden tournament earlier in the day and he was angry. So he was kind of upset about that. So I'm guessing that had something to do with it. Again, nobody talking about the fact that that none of that has anything to do with the fact that he was able to purchase a gun or multiple in this case and bring them with him in a public event, right? Like nothing, like nobody talks about that. They're all referring, they're, they're putting the blame solely and squarely on his shoulders. And yes, you know, Katz had been previously treated for psychological and emotional issues. Yes, his parents were divorced. Yes, he had a really difficult childhood growing up. He is not the only person in the US or in the world who's had a really, really, really rough time growing up and, and currently dealing with all of the other issues that he's dealing with. He, If everybody who had a rough time in their childhoods were able to just have a gun and shoot at will, we'd all be dead. Everybody, everybody in the world would be dead right now. <laughs> we'd all be dead. Uh, you know, so that's not necessarily the cause. It may be... A, a factor, of course, that has led to all of this, sure, but it is not the only thing. And that particular article, right, the author, that's all they talk about. And so, of course, again, for somebody who may be new to this particular set of circumstances, this particular uh, issue of gun control and, and 
know, uh, gun violence and video games and all of this other stuff. Yeah, uh, you could be like, yep, it's mental illness. And that, you know, if that's the first article you come across or you you keep reading more of the same articles because you're looking for that, you know, confirmation bias, as it were. Mm hmm. That's all you're going to be thinking that is that is the truth. And and that may be part of the truth. Oh, yeah. I know that one of the first, uh, I would say, in-depth uh, breakdowns I've seen of this story was actually one of a tweet sharing an article. And the tweet was really pushed to the fact of like, yeah, well, you know, this guy was seen by multiple health professionals. Uh, was diagnosed with uh, multiple, you know, mental issues, and you know, it was clear that uh, he should not have had a gun and got access to a gun. And then, of course, the article dives into that as well. So, if you know, if I didn't look into any other information, I I would probably go, yeah, maybe that that's that's it. Then it's it's just the fact of the mental illness. Um, now, are some people who are blaming the mental illness just trying to push that factor? No, I think I think so, many of these uh, platforms, uh, they have the right idea in the sense of, well, the mental illness did not help potentially. Again, if we really know what he had and what he was going through, um, it potentially did not help. And, it, and again, we can't then whitewash it and say, well, all men mental illness, right? Because people with anxiety, people with depression, that includes those individuals as well. People with schizophrenia. Again, there's a multitude. So are we going to say that that's just all of them then? Or is it the fact that we're saying that, well, specifically what he was going through. And at that point in time, then don't whitewash it and say all mental in this. If you're going to um, write an article like this, again, follow what uh, Point Park University said, which is um, understand the context. Mm -hmm. Be straightforward and to the point. So don't just be broad and do these broad strikes say all mental health no it was specifically because of x y and z that he had which is a mental illness but does not mean that all mental illness thus um induces violence that is an old trope that is an old stereotype that is just not true and so we have to keep that clear now again is that the only factor no the factor was that he could just easily get a gun he could easily carry it anywhere he want and the fact is too is that he just wasn't properly trained most likely yes he passed a firearms test but again between his emotional balance and the understanding of what this means to use this weapon in this type of situation there's no con there's certain connections that just were not made at least not clearly right and i'm not trying to make the 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 antagonist into a victim i'm not what I'm saying is there's multiple factors. You can't just, again, whitewash it or do broad strokes. You can't just blame it. You can't at all, actually, based on research, blame it on um, on video games. And you can't also just blame it on all mental illness because that is severely incorrect. and You're doing a disservice to your readership. Now, of course, there's another article which then dives deeper into that mental breakdown, right? Um, so I don't know if you want to actually jump into that one next, too. Um, yeah, there's actually a great article from uh, Vox.com that talks about the context that we were t just talking about, right? And there's articles and posts like this all over the Internet as well that talk about gun violence in a broader context, uh, to context, you know, as it pertains and is often a direct result of gun control and and most of the time nothing else really not even mental illness right or or there's like a, so many other factors that can contribute to it but the overarching um common thread through all of them is gun control and uh we'll link these as well in um our descriptions on podbean and itunes and you'll see them on our youtube as well so we definitely encourage you to read through these articles at your own pace as well because they are very informative um, but just a few highlights from this Vox article. Uh, supporters of gun rights look at America's high levels of gun violence and argue that, oh, guns are not the problem. They point to other issues from violence in video games and movies, to be fair here, uh, to the supposed breakdown of the traditional family. Most recently, they've blamed mental health issues for mass shootings. Uh, but as far as homicides go, people with mental illness are actually more likely to be victims, not perpetrators of violence. Michael Stone, a psychiatrist at Columbia University, maintains a database of mass shooters and wrote in a 2015 analysis that only 52 
out of the 235 killers in the database, which is about 22%, actually had mental illness. Uh, and he concludes, the mentally ill should not bear the burden of being regarded as the chief perpetrators of mass murder. And there is other research um, that is linked in that that is back that up. And the most interesting fact, actually, out of the entire article that I, that I thought, uh, and there's it's, it's chock full of interesting uh, facts uh, about uh, U.S. gun violence and gun control as it pertains to other countries in the world as well. But the most interesting one that I found is... Uh, mass shootings actually make up a small fraction of America's gun deaths. It constitutes less than 2% of such deaths in 2016, which doesn't feel like that, right? Because I, you know, articles, you look at articles online, <gasps> mass shooting every single day, mass shooting, mass shooting. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? That's less than 2% of gun related deaths in 2016 in America. So the other 98% have nothing to do with mass shootings. It has nothing to do with video games and violence and the mental instability of the person perpetrating and all this other stuff. They may be factors. There may be other factors that, you know, we obviously don't know yet. But the mass shootings are only less than 2%. According to CNN, the U.S. makes up less than 5% of the world's population but holds 31% of global mass shooters. So even though in in all the crimes and in, in so forth that happen, all the gun deaths that happen uh, even in the U.S., um, mass shootings overall are, are a fairly small percentage, but we hold the title, unfortunately, of mm -hmm. having the basically the most uh, mass shootings pretty much out of any other country, or almost. Again, uh, it holds up to 31% of global mass shooters. Uh, we take the cake in the world's population for that, basically. And, right. you know, studies have come out that we usually do in the U.S. have at least one mass shooting a month, which I is true per, facts. Like almost per day, one per day. Um, it, well, in that, too, you could look at the daily, you could look at monthly. But it, in general, at, at least, least yeah. at least in one month, you're going to have a mass shooting based on what we've seen thus far in the past five to ten years. Right. And, and mass shooting, of course, means um, at least two people uh, being shot from some some place that I read it at some point. I think that's how they, they were defining mass shooting. So at least two people being shot. Yeah. So, you know, uh, unfortunately, this is a thing that is just un it is becoming way too common, way too common. And, you know, so with this, though, we go, well, there you go. It's the fact that it's not video games then. It's not mental illness because we could see the research done here. That's a very small percentage. And again, most people with mental illness are actually the victims, not the perpetrators of violence. But yet we're still having these shootings like this happening at least once per month, uh, if not actually more. And so with that, it, you know, it's tough because none of these individuals are taking these chunks of information and putting it together into one article to really come to um, a, a, a real solid conclusion. Everyone is just kind of fixated on their own little niche of the story, right? And that can make things really difficult. And again, why people go, well, this is all fake news because this person is saying this and this person is saying that. So someone's got to be lying, right? Well, they might be overly focused on something too much. And again, there's a potential of lying. I, I can't really say, right? It really depends on the article, the how much research was actually done, so on and so forth. But, um, you know, really, one of the important things, too, though, is the fact that, you know, no one is just bringing all this information together into one article and saying, well, here are the multiple reasons. Now, let's find um, where it, it, the truth lies, which is usually somewhere in the middle. Right. And that's not happening. And unfortunately, it's being put on to us, the the end user, if you will, of media, of news um, to try to piece it all together, which is damn near impossible because that's not our focus. Right. We got our own lives to live as well. Our daily routines, everything else that we have to try to take in and compound down and, and try to understand as is, let alone also all of that. So, you know, journalism on a whole is just a very tough industry. Um, where you either try to do your job, but you're getting rushed, and so therefore you can't 
be as informative as you want to be and you can't get all the information um, you will, may also be a citizen journalist, and so this isn't like your full-time job or what pays the bills, but you try to get the time in to do the research or try to report these things. But again, what impacts that is time, money, the resources, uh, and, and getting your voice heard, right? Because not only are you trying to get the voices of many others who are getting impacted by a situation heard, but you've got to stand out too and have your content be seen in the first place. And so now all of a sudden we're getting these, you know, business factors coming into play that can really negatively impact solid research and information because like, well, I gotta be first, I gotta try to get more marketing on this, I've gotta spin it in a certain way, or I need to focus in on a very specific niche niche because people um, unfortunately stereotype this situation with this niche. So therefore it's gonna get eyes on it. So it's not that, you know, per se, my facts are wrong. It's just like, it's just maybe not the full story. It's not the full image. So people get rushed into that. And again, I'm not just focusing specifically on, on civilian journalists. No, I'm talking about all journalists and media in general. Um, there's also the, the part that plays, um, or excuse me, how uh, party alliances play out as well in the sense of our government, if they're more right-leaning, more left-leaning, um, which I hate those terms anyway. I, I, I feel like there's so much more than just a clear like x-axis of of left and right um so I, I, again I, I use that term loosely just because most people understand that term but i feel like you know it, it's usually at least in the u.s democratic or republican so which way do i do i want to go toward um there's just so many factors you know there's also the factors of advertisers as we mentioned too can kind of influence right if one of your advertisers is the nra and they're paying a big bulk of your um of your ad revenue then you're not going to be talking badly about them right so you might leave them out of the picture it's not that you're not putting blame in your articles to them but you're leaving their name out of it right it's it's half the truth again yeah we're half truthing <clears throat> at this point so you know again it, this is where like the fake news comes in and where people start doing these these blame games and pointing fingers and, and so forth and it, we've just really got put into a tough situation, right? And honestly, we just we do need some sort of, I think, media reform in a way, but I don't think it should be coming from the government either because it's not their right. By First Amendment, you know, these platforms have the right to share out this information as long as it's ideally honest and truthful in some form or fashion, though. You know, many people get called out for it on, on a daily basis for not being truthful. Um, but I, I think overall, these these media outlets need to really do a reform on themselves and think about what is important again. But will it happen for companies like CNN, MSNBC, Fox News and many others? I'm going to say personally, from a personal point of view, no, I just don't see that happening. Tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> and Pronto Shot uh, brings up a good point in our audience. You know, part of the responsibility is on the audience as well. Yes. You shouldn't hold one version as the single and only truth. You know, instead, everyone should take info from different media, analyze it, and finally build an opinion of their own. Exactly. And that's definitely our belief as well. Um, because it is hard, uh, especially nowadays, to uh, find out all the information that you need from just one place, right? Due to a variety of factors. It is important, um, and luckily we also live in an era, uh, in, a, in a time where this is easy to do, but it is important to look for other sources of information and uh, kind of build your own your own conclusions from there. Which, you know, as Evan said, you know, it's, it's hard to do when you are juggling your daily life and, you know, all these other things, but it is important because that's the only way that you'll be able to make truly informed decisions about your future and your children's future. Well, I think what comes into play, even though it can make things a little bit more convoluted, is to have more voices in the media. We have so many media outlets that are buying out each other and becoming this this gargantuan beast of a, of a <laughs> media platform. And there's no other voices that can say, no, excuse me, that's that's not right. Or we've done research to add on to this. And so I think we need more voices and we need that to be allowed more and to foster the growth of 
new and different um, media sources outside of the the what like four ma major media outlets that we have right now or three or something like that like it, it truly is insane um so i think fostering that i think also people realizing how much p power they have as a group like if yes. we all come together and say this information is wrong or you're misleading it and you're doing this and that and guess what i'm not visiting your website i'm not watching your online broadcasts which then hits your pocketbook because then from there advertisers will stop paying money to put it, uh, their ads in certain spots on your website or during your commercial breaks and thus you're going to be losing money and you sure in hell ain't going to get support from us as subscribers so until you change something and, as, and, and, and um, as soon as you start really breaking down news the way it needs to be instead of giving half truths or, or you know leaving things out intentionally and you, if you start bringing those back in, then yeah, we'll start supporting you and we'll start watching you and engaging with you. So, you know, that, but that needs to happen is the problem. We right. need more people questioning and then more people coming together and going, well, that, let's actually make an impact then. Indeed. Indeed. And with that, thank you so much for joining us today on episode 35 of Mind Mind TV with Evan and Tatiana. We are live every Thursday at 4 p.m. PDT and every Saturday at 2 p.m. PDT on Twitch, twitch.tv slash mindmindtv. If you're listening to us on Podbean, iTunes, or any of your other favorite podcast aggregator or watching us on YouTube, definitely join us. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. And until next time, just make sure you double check your sources of truth. <laughs> Have a good one, everyone.